for those of us who are in the field of physical medicine rehabilitation, also known as PM&R, we're also called physiatrists, not to be confused with psychiatrists or physical therapists. So just by show of hands, anybody familiar with the field of physiatry or physical medicine and rehab? I know somebody. For those of you who are not, uh, we are physicians who specialize in helping people maximize their function after a significant illness or injury or a condition that involves their nerves or muscles or bones. Uh, for some of us in the field, we work on the inpatient setting, managing rehabilitation programs for people who have sustained significant injuries like traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, or who've had amputations or have had strokes. But there's another part of our specialty that help patients with musculoskeletal conditions that may result in pain, such as low back pain and knee osteoarthritis, which you'll be hearing about tonight. Um, both of those are extremely common diagnoses. Our first lecturer is going to be Dr. Masato Nagao. He's a board specialized physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist who subspecializes in musculoskeletal medicine uh, and disorders of the spine. He also has expertise in the area of electrodiagnostics, which is uh, te uh, testing nerves and muscles. He's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery here at UCSF practicing at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, um, at the Orthopedic Institute at Mission Bay, and also at St. Luke's Hospital. He's gonna be providing us with information about low back pain, focusing on the causes of pain, the Im imaging techniques that might be utilized to diagnose the condition, as well as the surgical treatment options that, that, that might be available. Dr. Nagao. Thank you, Lisa. So thank you for coming uh, this busy Thursday evening. So my part uh, talk about uh, low back pain. So no, nothing to disclose about conflict of interest. So because of the limited time, so we focus on the three things. One, does MRI tell us everything? Two, why do I, do I have a pain for a long time? Three, what is the treatment? So start with a little bit of basic knowledge. So low back pain, so 75 to 85% of the adults experience low back pain in their lifetime, at least once. So uh, there is a second most common chief complaint to visit the primary doctor's office. So we have typically two kinds of patients. Jane, for the left side, 34-year-old female, who has a pain in the lower back and the pain shooting down to the posterior thigh to the calf. She also has a numbness in the foot. John on the right side, so she, he doesn't have a pain in the leg, but he has a uh, significant pain in the lower back and the upper buttock. So, um, for the frequency of the chain type pain is about 10 to 25%. So it depends on the article. And non-specific pain that without a radiculitis is more than 75%. So that we have a lot of people who doesn't have a radicular symptoms just for the lower, lower back pain. This is an imaging for the whole body from the side view. So we have a head to a Spine is beautifully curved to pelvic bone, hip and knee and uh, ankle. So head is the uh, heaviest part of the body and uh, all the weight straight go down to the spine, sacrum, hip joint, knee and ankle to the ground. But these are the uh, skeleton. So we have a muscle, it's very important to support the spine. Neck from front to the back, ab muscle, back muscle, thigh muscle, hamstring, and calf muscle, all are very important and balanced to support the uh, posture. Let's uh, take a look at the uh, bone. So upper part is a side view. This is from the top. So for the, from the top view, there is a hole is, uh, in the middle of the spine. And there are 
there is nerve running from the brain towards to the tailbone. So each part, the nerve, we call the nerve root, comes from the, each segment of the bone that is going to the right side, going to the left side. And the big nerve running from the brain go down to the neck, back to the lower back. This is a little bit detail from the nerve we call the anterior column from the front part. There is a bone here, there are two bones here. In between the bone, we have a disc. And also, strong ligament support the anterior part of the element. Posterior part, we have a small joint, we call the facet joint. And also, we have a very strong ligament here, and also we have a ligament here to support the posterior element. So the first question, does MRI tell us everything? This is a normal MRI, so we have a same figure here. So vertebral body, we see it here. And the discs in between the vertebral body, discs are here. This is a nerve here. It's a little bit whitish, bright part is a fluid inside the spinal column. This is a one of the patient MRI. What do you see the difference from the normal? So we see the signal of the disc a little bit darker than here, and some part is a bright. This is dark. And also disc level, we have some small indent here. However, this patient never has a pain in the back. So this is an article from the American Journal of Neuroradiology published in 2015. They pick up more than 3,000 people who do not have a pain and take an MRI. Two neuroradiologists read those MRI. They see 37% per, of the people in 20 years old has an abnormality and 96%, almost 100% uh, abnormality seen in the 80-year-old male s people. So that they conclude this abnormal finding on the MRI do not relate, do not, uh, the pain, pain cause. It's unassociated with the pain. It's a just an aging process. So spine MRI generally does not distinguish between painful or and non-painful spine structure because as I told you, that's abnormality seen in the normal population. It does not constitute a diagnosis in most cases. I would say most cases because some of them we need MRI. But usually the diagnosis is made by based on the history and the physical exam and plus MRI or other imaging. It does not affect treatment plan. So we treat not for the MRI finding, we treat, we treat the patient symptoms so that this is based on the history and the physical exam. So why do I take a MRI? So we need to uh, see overall idea of the spine structures. We rule out infection or tumor. These are the very serious uh, general uh, problem. So sometimes it's life threatening. Also, we see the nerves are pinched or compressed or inflamed. Also, if we need a surgery, we need to do the MRI for the pre-surgical planning. Second question, why do I have pain for a long period of time? So uh, vertical line is a percentage of the patient with pain and uh, this line is for the time. So the patient has pain in some degree of the injury of the lower back. So this is a, spot, this is a line here. So they, they have a, almost 100% of people has a pain. In two weeks, 50% of the people are getting better. Then up to 12 weeks, 90% of the people feels better, improves the pain, and 10% is prolonged beyond the three months. 
This one is regardless we, we treat or without treatment. So from zero to six weeks, there is a uh, different uh, uh, article, but uh, we generally say up to six weeks, we, we say acute phase. And beyond the 12 weeks, it's a very persistent pain for the 10% people, we, we call the chronic pain. So let's see about uh, why we feel the pain. This is a peripheral nerve, this is a spinal cord, and this is a brain. So we feel the pain in brain. So if something going on with the lower back or other part of the body, we have something injury, pain goes to the spine and spine goes to the brain. And then brain feels the pain. What kind of pain, where the pain is. At the same time, the brain send the signal to the uh, spinal cord to inhibit the pain. So try not to feel the pain. That is a normal process of the pain. But if the pain is persistent and very strong, so always pain in there, so the nerve has excitement, so increased excitability. So peripheral nervous system, central nervous system, all the nerves are excited. So a lot of different and the uh, pain signal goes towards the brain. So the brain feels a little bit different way to feel the pain. Then normally we have an inhibitory process, but at this time for the brain does not send the inhibitory signal anymore. So in this situation, we call the pain hypersensitivity, sensitization, or wind up. So that acute pain for the chronic pain is a different situation. Chronic pain, it's all the, different, all the system from the not only the back part, but the brain may be modulated and, uh, and uh, feels a different way of the pain. So chronic low back pain, what happened is once in the pain, people has a defensive reaction. And then muscle in the circulation in the muscle may be decreased and the metabolism is changed. Then it causing the muscle spasms and limited spine motion. On the other side, because of the back pain, people feel the uh, emotional stress and that causes anxiety or depression. <laughs> then psychological modulation. Then once it happens, people feel very fear of a movement. I cannot do it very because of the, it may, it may cause a pain. So this part we call the con deconditioning for the muscle part. And the, this part, as I told you the previous slide, that is a sensitization. So that for the acute process and the chronic process, we see the different way uh, of the mechanism of the pain. Now, uh, let's talk about what is a treatment. This is a, a very uh, simple scheme for the low back pain. So we have Jane for the who has a back pain and the radicular symptoms. John has a, only for the back pain without the radicular symptoms. So with radiculitis, radicular pain, that is we know it's probably the nerve related so that we focus to treat for the nerve compression. It's including for this one, for the medication, maybe injection, physical therapy, or maybe down the line, it may be the surgery may be needed. For the no radicular pain for the back pain is a little bit difficult to treat it. So we have a lot of things lifestyle modification with the posture, education, how to bend it, how to bring the object, or if the people has an overweight, we need to in encourage for the weight control. So some medication, maybe we need a couple of different medication combination and exercises and psychological approach. But 
we don't have any single best treatment. So this is a previous slide for the chronic pain, for the blue cycle and the red cycle. So blue cycle is more muscle related. Red cycle is more psychological related. So that this, this figure, so we need exercises for the muscle part and the psychological approach is very important to approach to the chronic low back pain. This is a John for the back pain, no uh, radicular symptoms. This is a figure, a picture. What do you think? So we see the lateral view, a little bit overweight, probably. OK, so this is a model. So we have a beautiful line for the probably very thin pe person. So we have a weight go straight. And the beautiful curvature, particularly lower back, we have some curvature here. When you see it here, for the John, for the weight line is a little bit more forward. And the back part is decrease the uh, uh, curvature more straight. Also, lower, so the hip, knee, ankle should be straight to balance it, but for his, a little bit bent the knee. So this means we are not, we are not sure which one first, lower back or the knee, but probably the knee problem, knee pain makes a, uh, uh, knee flexion contracture for the tightness of the hamstring makes a pelvic bone inclinated so that this posture, like a uh, weight bearing uh, angle makes more forward and the lower back gets decreased curvature. That's a possibility. So that for his case, not only the medication, not only focus on lower back, we need to see all the lower back to the uh, knee and ankle. So get the, all the muscle uh, stretch out and get balanced. So recently, American College of Physicians Clinical Practice Guideline published in 2017 is an um, article review and they recommended for the exercise, it's a move, move, move. So exercise is very important. Exercise therapy, multidisciplinary rehabilitation. Also uh, for the alternative medicine, so Tai Chi and yoga are also beneficial. Regarding the psychological approach, same uh, American College of Physician Clinical Practice Guideline 2017, Cognitive behavioral therapy, so we call the CBT, or mindfulness-based stress reduction are also very helpful for the chronic pain. So besides exercise or uh, psychology approach, uh, spinal manipulation and massage and acupuncture are also helpful the, uh, according to the uh, clinical practice guideline at the same. Uh, but these are the very short period of time, and the effectiveness are a little bit lower, but some help. So our goal is decrease the pain and increase the function. But uh, we need a team-based approach, and multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, people are going to uh, treat the patient. So we have a little bit time, so... Uh, I won't make a quiz. Okay, question one. Which is the best explanation about spine MRI? Every patient should have an MRI. It gives a definite diagnosis. Abnormality may be seen in normal uh, aging process. It tells painful and non-painful spine. Right answer is abnormality may be seen in the normal aging process. So we don't need to take an MRI for everyone. So we knew, as I told you, for the, there is a normal aging process. We don't need it. So that sometimes a patient in the uh, clinic, so, what, so when I ask what's the problem, someone said, oh, I have an MRI for the disc degeneration. I have a facet arthritis. But it's not, a, 
I want to hear, I want to hear where the pain and what, what kind of pain, those things. Okay, we don't treat the MRI finding. Also, MRI, we, the diagnosis based on the uh, history and the physical exam, not MRI is kind of information. Okay, and also the, it, because of the normal people has a abnormality, it's not uh, tells, uh, differentiate uh, the painful and non-painful spine. Very good. So next one, which is a least relevant to chronic low back pain. Least means uh, not likely. So drug seeking behavior, fear of movement, emotional stress, muscle spasms. Very good. So drug seeking behavior. So for, we sometimes use uh, opioid medication for the pain control. But the drug-seeking behavior is a different for the opioid dependence or opioid addiction. It's not related to back pain. So for the muscle part, for the, do you remember that we have a blue cycle and red cycle? Blue cycle is a muscle related, so muscle spasm is one of them. And the red cycle is more psychological problem. So that is a, uh, a emotional stress because of the pain and uh, down the line, the patient fear, uh, feels a fear of movement. Okay, very good. For the last question, which is a good treatment option for low back pain? Increasing opioid doses, <laughs> exercise and psychological approach, multi-level spine fusion su surgery, drinking more wine. I, I would buy this one, <laughs> drinking more wine. <laughs> so, I like this answer for the drinking more wine. <laughs> yeah, but increasing opioid dose, as I told you, this is, uh, we use uh, opioid, but we don't need to increasing. So we need a multiple medica medical med medicine tr uh, combination. And the spine surgery, it's a very little information about this. So for the chronic pain, it's uh, exercises, and the psychological approach is very important. And drinking more wine, probably, but I don't know. <laughs> it's not the best option. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have the uh, question the later. We're going to be moving on to our second lecture. Our second lecturer is also a physiatrist who has had um, special training in pain management. Dr. Zachary McCormick is also a uh, physical medicine rehabilitation specialist who has expertise in musculoskeletal disorders and electrodiagnostics. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery with practice, at, uh, practice sites at, set, that include Zuckerberg San Francisco General and also the Orthopedic Institute at Mission Bay. Um, Dr. Uh, McCormick will be discussing or give, providing us information about knee osteoarthritis, how to recognize and treat the problem, and at its mildest and most severe, severe stages. Dr. McCormick? All right. So as Dr. Pasquale mentioned, I'll be speaking about pain management of knee osteoarthritis. This is another massive topic that we certainly don't have time to cover in extreme depth, but what I'm going to try to do is give you guys a decent overview of what exactly NEOA is, um, what causes pain associated with knee osteoarthritis, and you'll see that abbreviation OA, short for osteoarthritis, scope of the problem, um, and then the spectrum of care, so how we think about treating this this problem from its mildest stages to more severe. So what is knee OA? Um, this is a degenerative condition. Um, it's characterized by these four elements. So the first is synovial inflammation. The synovium is essentially a, a layer of cells that resides inside joints. Um, and we see in a variety of arthritic conditions that it can become inflamed and inflammation in itself can be painful. Uh, we also see prominent loss of articular cartilage and articular is just another reference to the joint. So um, there are cartilage surfaces that, um, that provide cushioning, um, kind of decrease shear forces, loading forces on joints and we see loss of that cartilage with osteoarthritis. We also see subchondral sclerosis and cysts. And what those are, um, sclerosis essentially is a fibrosis and, and change of the surface, the undersurface of the, um, the bone at the joint surface. 
and cysts are essentially fluid-filled cavities. We can see formation of these things, um, kind of abnormal bony growths near the joint surface in osteoarthritis. And then we see joint hypertrophy as well. So abnormal, other kinds of abnormal bony changes with um, a bias towards growth of bone, um, with hypertrophy meaning growth or essentially expansion of. And then osteophytes are basically another word, medical term for bone spurs. So what does this look like? Well, um, familiarize, seal this in your mind. So this figure here on the left is meant to be a fairly normal representation of a knee. So this up here, we're catching an image of uh, the shaft of the femur, which transitions into the femoral condyles. Here is, this is the tibia. So tibial plateau is here. Uh, tibial flares, the fibula, this is all part of the lower leg. And then we have the knee joint in the middle. So we have a smooth articular surface. We have joint space here between the femur and the tibia. Um, and we don't see synovium, but we'll just say that you have a normal synovium. It's producing joint fluid, um, and it's not inflamed. So over on the right side, this is a little bit, this is a little cartoony, I realize, but um, I think it gives an idea of the sort of changes that we see in osteoarthritis. So um, this is that, these are supposed to represent osteophytes or bone spurs. There's general hypertrophy of the joint. There's a loss of cartilage. There's a loss of that joint space. So where there's room here between the, uh, the femur and the tibia, we've lost it. Um, you can imagine just looking at this, it looks painful. Now, the, um, what I will say is, as Dr. Nagao was speaking about with regard to low back pain, having arthritis doesn't mean that you have pain. It's, they're, it's not a necessary one-to-one -one correlation. Um, but if someone has knee pain and they have changes like this, we can make a pretty good guess about what's causing their pain. So let's take a look at some radiographs. This is, this is generally how we evaluate osteoarthritis. We can do advanced imaging studies like MRIs and CT scans. But for seeing osteoarthritis, we can, we can get a pretty good idea from just plain x-rays. Um, now, this is meant to match up one-to-one. -one. So if we go back, we have the normal knee, and we have the arthritic knee. So this is a radiograph of a fairly normal knee. Nothing's perfectly normal, but um, close enough to it. So if we look here, here again, this is the, the femoral shaft into the condyles, um, tibial shaft into the, the, the tibial flares, tibial plateau. And this, we can see there's a fair amount of joint space here in between um, <coughs> at the joint line between uh, tibia and femur. We don't see any abnormal bony growth. Um, this is probably just a bit of artifact. Um, I wouldn't consider this a sclerotic change, but um, if we see brighter looking bone, that, that can mean bony sclerosis, which is consistent with osteoarthritis. Um, we can't see inflammation on an x-ray, but we'll presume that there isn't really any inflammation there. Now, if we go over to the right, um, you can tell that there's quite a few abnormalities here. So especially at the, in the medial compartment of the joint, we see a near complete loss of that joint space. So if, you know, again, matching it up here, lots of space, it's gone. Um, here, this is probably not artifact. So this is bony sclerosis, a little bit of extra bony growth and fibrotic changes in, in the, the um, below the articular surface within the bone. Um, we see these little guys here, these spurs, that would be an osteophyte. So we see spurring here, we see spurring here, maybe some additional spurring um, in the middle of the joint there. And what you can also appreciate is this person has started to develop a little bit of deformity. So where we have fairly nice alignment of tibia and fibula here, excuse me, tibia and femur here, um, you're starting to get some angling. So a little bit of loss of um, the normal angle at that joint. Um, and possibly some related instability. This is a lateral view, and it's really just reflecting the same stuff. So this is the same patient as the prior slide, and this correlates to the same patient who has osteoarthritis on the prior slide. This is just another view. So this is the kneecap or the patella. Um, there's a pretty smooth surface here between the articulation of the, the kneecap and the femur. Um, this may be a little bit deceiving. Uh, it looks like there could be irregularity. I'll just, I'll, I'll mention that there really isn't. 
um, it's just the angle that we're seeing. And here, um, this is the patient with uh, osteoarthritis, um, more narrowing um, in that compartment between the, the, the kneecap of the patella and the femur. Uh, looks like a bit of spurring here, extra bony growth. Um, and then here at what we're seeing, um, a lateral angle of both the, the medial and lateral uh, compartments of the knee, there's extra bony growth there as well. And then this is known as a sunrise view, where we're looking down on the knees and the kneecaps. So here's the kneecap. Again, nice amount of space here. Over here, uh, the patella has actually started to slide laterally. And this over here is another osteophyte or, um, or bone spur. It's pretty, pretty obvious. OK, so what actually causes pain? Well, we, we alluded to some of these issues already. but. Um, synovitis or inflammation of that synovial lining within the joint is inherently painful. Inflammation causes pain. Um, there, are there are mechanical changes that occur. So we see increased friction with a loss of um, some of the joint fluid perhaps because of a loss of, of synovium um, as well as a loss of that articular cartilage. Um, we also see decreased uh, shock absorption capacity with that loss of articular cartilage. And then with, um, with some of the instability and joint angle changes that might occur, we can see stretch on the, the ligaments and the capsule that are supportive of that knee joint. Um, and instability in itself um, can be painful. Then this feeds into the idea of pain sensitization. And I will, um, Dr. Nagao gave a really nice overview of this, so I'll, I'll seal it for you guys. This can happen with any part of the body. It happens with the low back. It can certainly happen with a knee um, or another area where there's chronic pain. So a similar model here, if we have the, uh, the afferent sensory nerve um, that is sending pain signals from a painful knee joint um, up through the dorsal root ganglia, which is close to the spinal cord, in through the spinal cord, and then sending pain signals up to the brain, we know from a variety of studies, and even specific to the knee, that there are neuroplastic changes that occur along these pathways, along the peripheral nervous system, uh, within the spinal cord, at the level of the brain. We literally see changes in the connections between some of these neurons um, and the expression of various um, uh, receptors that mediate pain signaling with pain that goes on for three months, six months longer with chronic pain. And this is well established in knee osteoarthritis. So, um, so scope of the problem, um, extremely common. 25 million in the US alone have um, chronic pain due to knee OA. 13% um, of adults over 65 years of age. And I'll, when we start talking about treatments, it's notable that um, we think of the definitive treatment for knee osteoarthritis as a knee replacement. And if we take away all those bony changes, inflammation in the synovium, et cetera, pain should be gone. Well, 20, 10 to 20% of patients still have chronic knee pain after a knee replacement. We don't really know why. Part of it may be that peripheral and central sensitization. Um, could be other extra articular issues in the region of the knee. But um, it's a challenging problem. So this slide, um, this is a bit of an overview of how we think about treating NEOA from the mild stages um, all the way to more severe. And there's another stage after surgery that I'll, I'll talk briefly about at the very end. But we think about pain and disability, and that, as Dr. Nagao mentioned, the same in, in parallel to treating back pain, we want to decrease pain, we want to improve function or decrease disability. And we start out with the most conservative treatments, the lowest risk treatments, um, and then we proceed to possibly more invasive procedures if the safer, easier techniques are not working. And I'll go through, you don't, I know these are a bit small, you might not be able to read them, but we'll go through each of these and talk about some of the, the core elements of treating knee pain at each stage that's related to osteoarthritis. So basic stuff. Um, new diagnosis, pain is not too severe, possibly um, fewer really prominent radiographic changes. We're gonna recommend weight loss. 
um, bracing, uh, possibly a cane or assistive device to offload the knee. Um, and the idea with some of these is, is we are trying to decrease loading forces on the knee itself. So less weight, less, less loading on the knee. Use of a cane can also be used to offload the knee. Um, and, and then other exercises, um, such as quad strengthening, if we're loading muscles more than we are um, relying on the, uh, the joint surfaces to bear weight, um, that may also help with pain symptoms. Now, some of the other basic treatments we might use are targeted at inflammation. So we might use ice, very, very simple, inexpensive anti-inflammatory. Um, we might use oral anti-inflammatory agents. Um, a variety of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, would be probably a first choice for a lot of people. Um, and we, we might try heat as well. Heat isn't necessarily working on uh, inflammation, but many people find it helpful to relieve some amount of pain. Okay, so presuming that we've tried these things, they're not helping as much, we might prescribe a formal course of physical therapy. Now, there are a variety of um, different approaches that various therapists would use, and everyone's a little different, but I think these are some of the core principles that are useful. So we're gonna work on, um, we're gonna work on a lot of quadricep and hip girdle strength, because again, we're, our goal is to put more force and weight through muscles um, and su sort of supportive structures um, above and below the knee as opposed to through the joint itself. We're gonna work on gait. Um, we're gonna work on uh, posture and ergonomic changes that might help with, um, with decreasing loads on, on the knee as well. Um, and we're gonna try to address any imbalances in flexibility if possible. Um, with, you know, if knee pain becomes more chronic, um, it's often useful to, to work on techniques for reducing pain exacerbations and pacing, which is a pretty simple idea, but um, really just means if you have a lot of pain when you walk 10 blocks, then try walking five and taking a break and then walk the other five. And obviously that you know, becomes more complex, but pacing becomes really important. Um, and then we try to develop a graded independent home exercise program. The goal isn't to have people in physical therapy for 20 sessions, 30 sessions over and over. It's um, you know, establish the, um, the exercises and the treatments that are gonna be helpful and um, self-sustained at home. Okay. So possibly we might pair physical therapy with injections. We might try physical therapy, and if that's not working well or there's limitations, then we might try injections. Um, some of it's patient preference, sort of um, cater to the individual. But there are a variety of, of injections that we might try. So the first one, and that many of you may be familiar with the idea of a cortisone injection. That's kind of just a general term, cortisone, um, but referring to a steroid. And, um, the purpose of injecting steroid into the joint is, is mainly to decrease inflammation. So if we do have inflamed synovium, um, this injecting a steroid right locally at the joint rather than taking an oral agent for inflammation, um, that should be helpful. There's also a property of corticosteroids where um, they can stabilize nerve membranes and they will actually decrease kind of irritated nerves that are firing um, more than they should be. Now this is a little bit less relevant for, for knee osteoarthritis as opposed to an injection where we're directly treating a nerve and we're injecting right around a hyper irritable nerve. But it, it may have effects in arthritis as well for osteoarthritis. And we tend to try to limit these to about three injections per year. You know, we worry with higher doses of steroids that are given repeatedly over and over again that there are some side effects to chronic steroid use. The next treatment that's a possibility as an injectable is um, hyaluronic acid. And that, you might have heard of Synvisc um, or you know, other um, trade names for, for hyaluronic acid. But this is a, a molecule that the body naturally produces. It's within the joint. Um, it reduces loading and shear forces within the joint. And the idea is that if we supplement it, um, perhaps we can restore some of those um, the properties of hyaluronic acid that are perhaps lost in osteoarthritis. We know that giving an injection of hyaluronic acid, not only are we you know, 
boosting or supplementing it directly, but it actually produce, it causes the joint to produce more of that molecule on its own. So in this case, depending on the preparation, um, we can give one to five injections as a treatment course. Um, some, of, some of the time, uh, some of these commercial preparations are made so that we can get all of it in with one injection, whereas others it has to be given sequentially. It's just a difference in the, in the way that the, the medication is produced. <clears throat> um, and we generally think about giving, giving this treatment course twice a year if it works. Um, if it doesn't work, we wouldn't necessarily repeat it. So the last injectable, and this is, this is a bit more investigational. There are more and more studies coming out, but um, some of you may have heard of the idea of regenerative medicine. And um, clearly it's really appealing, the idea that maybe rather than just reducing pain, we can actually restore some of these structures that are um, degenerating. There are a number of different agents that are that are available, again, they're all considered investigational at this point. Um, Platelet-rich plasma is one. So we can draw blood from your own body, spin it down, and extract a layer um, from that blood, platelet-rich plasma, and it's got a variety of growth factors in it. Um, and there, there's developing evidence that if we inject this into people who have knee osteoarthritis, that there is some regeneration of the articular surfaces. Stem cells are another, and there are a variety of types of stem cells that they can be derived from fat or adipose tissue, from bone marrow, and actually from placental fluid as well. And again, the idea here is that we're trying to, to promote chondrogenesis or um, regrowth of the cells that produce um, cartilage within joints. So th these options, they're available, they're out there. Um, they have not been used for as long as some of the, the older agents like steroids that have been used for decades. But from what we can tell, they're probably safe. And um, there's you know, more and more evidence is emerging. Um, what we don't know are, are longer term effects and how people will do um, years down the line. And right now, the major, the major downside is cost. So this brings us to the next stage. We've tried all of our, our easy, inexpensive, safe uh, treatment options. We've done some formal physical therapy. We've tried some injections. Um, still really significant pain and disability. Um, now we start to think about uh, more invasive options. And uh, as I mentioned, a total knee replacement is always an option. Um, that is considered to generally be the definitive treatment. We take away all those painful structures. We put a metal prosthesis in there. Um, there are people who absolutely do not want surgery, no matter what, and uh, there are people that can't have it for um, various medical reasons. They might have too many other concomitant um, medical issues that it wouldn't be safe to undergo general anesthesia, for example. Um, uh, high BMI body mass index might be a contraindication or may, may make it so that we, we just cannot perform a knee replacement. So in this case, there is another emerging technique. Um, it's been used now for a very long time for treating certain kinds of low back pain, um, and probably about seven to eight years for treating pain in the knee from osteoarthritis. Um, and this is the idea of taking away sensation or partially taking away sensation to the joint so that the structure itself isn't being changed, but we're disrupting the ability of those pain signals to make it from the knee up to the brain. And there's more than one way to do this. Um, one common way is to use a technology called radio frequency uh, ablation. And this is essentially, uh, this is a machine that's you know, connected to a cable wire here, and this is an electrode. That electrode um, is guided down um, a hollow needle that the very tip of it um, has a little strip of metal that's shown here, and the electrode is inside that. Um, that electrode emits radio frequency energy. And the simple way to think of that is it works kind of like a microwave. So those waves cause the, the uh, tissue, the water within the surrounding tissue to vibrate and heat up. And with this, we can create these very specific controlled lesions of predictable size. 
So we have different kinds of, uh, of needles that cause different shapes of, um, of coagulation, essentially, of the, of the surrounding tissue. Now these look big here, but this, these are really millimeters, so they're very, very small, and we can be very precise. Um, now there's a variety of studies that, that have delineated some of the sensory innervation to the knee joint. And this is actually a, this is a figure taken from one of those cadaveric studies where they dissected down knees, they found the nerves that supply sensation to the knee, they're called genicular nerves. Um, they, have, they carry all sensory uh, neurons and no motor fibers. So if we were to disrupt these nerves, they won't cause weakness in the leg, whereas other nerves would carry they, they control motor function and strength. If we were to disrupt them, it would cause major problems with walking and, and various activities of daily living. So what this is showing here, this again, this is the, the femur, this is the tibia, and this, they placed a wire here that's right alongside one of the genicular nerves. So there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. And what we can do is, um, is we can guide those radio frequency electrodes right to the site of those nerves and disrupt the fibers. What you're seeing in this image is actually, these are not radio frequency electrodes. These are actually just fine gauge needles. Because what we do before we ever do a radio frequency procedure is we do a, a test or a diagnostic block where we inject just a tiny, tiny amount of local anesthetic right at where that nerve is. Um, if the pain goes away or a dramatic amount of the pain is, is reduced, um, then it tells us there's, a, there's probably a decent chance that the radio frequency procedure will provide substantial pain relief. So what you're seeing here is this is the very tip of a needle. Um, this is the hub or sort of the, the end that's outside of the skin and it's been guided under x-ray, under fluoroscopic or x-ray guidance to the site of uh, the genicular nerves. And there's one here, there's one here, there's another here. There are other genicular nerves as well, but some of them are too close to motor fibers, so we don't want to go near them. And then this is an image of, uh, of what it looks like when those radio frequency electrodes have been placed. And so where those fine gauge needles were in the previous image, we've now placed uh, on a different day after we've assessed the diagnostic response to the local anesthetic injection, um, we, we now have placed the the radio frequency electrodes. Um, and as I alluded to before, um, if this doesn't work and a patient is a candidate for surgery, um, then certainly a knee replacement uh, could be performed. But what about those patients who, um, who do not do well after knee replacement? And this, is, this is a metal prosthesis, right? So this is what a total knee replacement looks like um, under x-ray. That um, that joint surface is now replaced by metal. And uh, this has been now introduced probably five years ago, but there are clinicians who started using this radio frequency technique to try to take away some of that chronic pain that people have even after um, a knee replacement, where the knee replacement has not solved the issue. Um, and again, there's some early evidence that this may be helpful. So again, there's our spectrum of care um, from the the simplest, safest treatments to the most invasive. And just to summarize, we talked about knee osteoarthritis uh, being a, de a degenerative condition, major cause of pain and disability, extremely common. And um, we talked about the treatments ranging from conservative to surgical, and then possibly some post-surgical options if chronic pain persists. And, um, and then I touched on some of these novel treatments that are starting to develop an evidence base and, and may and are, seem promising for, um, for treating the osteoarthritis pain that's not responding to other measures. So just a few references, and I think we'll have plenty of time for questions. Great question. So the, the question is how do we decipher between pain that's related to knee osteoarthritis versus tendonitis? Um, so, um, Tendonitis is generally a condition that um, it, it's going to present very, very differently, and it's not going to be associated with some of the radiographic changes that we see in 
um, and osteoarthritis. So tendonitis specifically would be inflammation at, at some of the tendons. And some of the tendons that often get inflamed or, or irritated around the knee might be the patellar tendon, the quadriceps tendon. And sometimes there's, um, there's some uh, tendons that, that uh, that insert onto the medial knee from the hamstrings that become inflamed and painful. Um, generally, the history is really different. So uh, weight-bearing is, is often going to be really painful. Walking, weight-bearing with osteoarthritis. Um, tendonitis might be more of an issue, especially with like a patellar tendonitis. Um, uh, more anterior knee pain than medial knee pain, and possibly with really deep knee bending, walking stairs. Now there's overlap there with osteoarthritis as well. Um, but uh, tendonitis also doesn't tend to be as chronic of an issue. It can be, um, but we often, uh, we distinguish also between tendonitis and tendinopathy, where tendonitis is a true inflammation of a tendon that really doesn't last that long for the most part. Whereas tendinopathy, um, is a disorganization of some of those tendon fibrils. And if we actually do um, uh, tissue sections of these tendons, um, painful tendons, chronically painful tendons, often don't have any inflammation or, or no tendonitis. It's, it may be a tendinopathy. And we don't know exactly why those kind of disorganized fibers of, uh, of the tendons do cause pain. Um, there's, there's some thought that there's abnormal uh, vascular growth into the tendons. And there's evidence that, um, uh, that if we can get rid of those vessels, it often might help with pain too. But that's another, that's another totally another, uh, area of study um, that we don't perfectly understand, but um, does that answer your question? Well, because you're saying that there's overlap and that the radiographics aren't necessarily... The radiographic findings are very different, so that's probably the best way that we can distinguish between tendonitis and osteoarthritis type pain is, is on imaging. So the question is, um, so during the night time, for the, during the sleeping, the people sleep for the eight hours or nine hours, the pain gets more in the buttock or the lower back. So those questions probably no radicular symptoms, just the pain stays in the lower back. So the mostly it may be from the joint of the facet in the lower back part or the maybe soft tissue issues. For the during the sleeping, the we don't know how how what's the uh, uh, positioning for the during the sleeping. So the it, it may be the very wicked positioning during the sleeping. That may be the stretch out or the part of the muscle or imbalance. Or maybe the mattress of the, uh, like a pillow, that may affect to the position, posture during the, um, uh, during the sleeping. So that it's very difficult to tell one word, but uh, it, you, you can try the, uh, different mattress, different, po different pillow, the different height of the pillow, or the different uh, quality of the uh, structure of the pillows. Those are the probably the very, uh, very uh, fast to try. So uh, the question is, uh, is, that, is that positioning that causes uh, permanent damage? But I would say no. Uh, because of the most of the most of the times, uh, uh, as I showed the slide, that uh, because of the bad positioning makes a circulation of the metabolism of the muscle is changed, so that the muscle gets spasms. So if you do the uh, very good stretching exercises, that could regain the circulation and to meta get get back to the normal metabolism. So that I would not say it's a permanent damage. Uh, great question. So the um, uh, question is, is essentially what are the repercussions of radiofrequency ablation um, on inflammation? And, uh, and the second part of the question was tissue, tissue regeneration. regeneration. Yeah. So um, no. So RFA, there's, it's de it's, unfortunately, it's a destructive process, um, not a regenerative process. So the only agents that we have that really create any kind of um, a rebuild of the joint surfaces theoretically would be the platelet-rich plasma uh, or stem cells. And again, really early stages of research. Um, so we, we don't have slam dunk studies that suggest that it, it, it's really clear that we get great regeneration. And to some extent, uh, hyaluronic acid, because we do know that if we inject a little bit that the um, the synovium will actually start to create more fluid and there is some restoration of uh, hyaluronic acid that is independent of the, just the, 
the uh, supplemental um, agent that we're injecting. But radio frequency, uh, really the simplest way to think of it is that we are stopping the ability of the joint to uh, signal pain up to the brain by disrupting some of those sensory connections. Um, and if it also restored tissue, that would be incredible. But no, unfortunately not the case. Um, that's, a, that's another great question. So um, the evidence is fairly mixed on how much glucosamine and chondroitin really help. And depending on the study you read, um, the, how well that study was conducted and some of the you know, confounders that can um, degrade the quality of a study, uh, it goes back and forth. Now, um, you're probably not going to do much damage. You're really not going to cause much harm by taking glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, <laughs> there are some really interesting studies in uh, either mice or rat models um, where glucosamine and chondroitin seem to cause a little bit of degeneration of discs, intervertebral discs, where we, we, the, the investigators were hoping to show the opposite, that discs that were partially degenerated maybe were restored by taking glucosamine and chondroitin. Now, do I think that taking glucosamine and chondroitin will, will lead to disc degeneration? Unlikely. But um, there are a fair number of studies out there that suggest that they probably don't make a major difference. That said, these are, these are not, um, they're not going to hurt you either. Yeah. You guys are asking fantastic questions. So um, flat feet can cause a whole bunch of problems, right? Uh, Dr. Nagao kind of showed us an image of the kinetic chain um, and how we think about if, if you were to have some overpronation or some loss of those arches and you have um, uh, kind of inward tilting of the feet because they're, they're flatter than you know, what they're supposed to be, uh, that's going to cause uh, the knees to stress inward a little bit too. It's going to cause upstream repercussions on the hip joints and potentially on the low back. So um, flat feet in general, um, if you have pain anywhere in the lower extremities or the back and you do have flat feet, it's absolutely worth trying to correct it. Um, orthotics can potentially be helpful. Now, is there a direct correlation with flat feet and the development of OA? Not that I'm aware of. And it, it's possible I'm, I might not just be aware of the study, um, but I don't, I don't think that by not correcting flat feet that you will necessarily have a higher risk of developing OA. Um, but, uh, but I think it's always a good thing if you do have pain somewhere in the body, um, looking up or downstream to an adjacent joint um, is helpful, absolutely. You guys have asked a lot of terrific questions. I think that was the last one that we can do formally, and we'll absolutely stay up here and we can answer more. Uh, but thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs>